So thinking about, thinking about cultural trends and their implications for us for engagement, if we acknowledge that we are living in a different time, uh, some of our structures, some of our terms of engagement must change along with them. If we are to continue to be effective, if we're continuing to engage on a, on a deep personal level, again, we must, uh, as Jesus did, incarnate ourselves find a way to relate to and become like in order to reach. And I think as we think of this, uh, there's three sort of key insights that provide a framework for our cont contemporary Canadian culture and ultimately highlight the importance of community and relationship when engaging with people with the gospel today. And so the first one, as we see on the screen, is the idea of uh, we live in a postmodern country. And in some ways, the 21st century is not dissimilar to the first century world of the early church. The exclusive claim is Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life is offensive in a culture that proposes many ways, truths, and sources of life. Jesus can be our personal Lord and Savior, but not the Lord of Lords, and definitely not the Savior of the world. Truth claims, and therefore the gospel, have become privatized and removed from the public sphere. So that's postmodern. The second thing... When we look at our Canadian cultures, it's post-Christian. And in other ways, the context of our 21st century Christianity is different from that of our early church. The early church introduced a radically new ethic to what would have been a uniquely pre-Christian audience. Yet today, we live in a very different post-cultural or post-Christian country where Christianity has consciously been rejected. The current culture wants the kingdom, but not the king, the life without the life giver. In a post-Christian society that believes, believes that they have tasted and seen that the Lord is bad, living the, gospel, living the gospel in that public sphere is increasingly complex and challenging. And lastly, not only post-modern, post-Christian, but we're also post-social. And a philosophy of hyper-individualism has shaped the culture around us. Technology advertised with the promise of connectivity has in many ways disconnected us. Urbanization has drawn millions of people together in apartment blocks of nameless neighbors. Even the family unit has re been reduced in size, leaving us fewer people to call family. An autonomous, self-seeking existence has been encouraged under the banner of individual freedom, yet for many the result has been isolation and dislocation. And so understanding sort of our postmodern, post-Christian, and post-social society helps us frame our discussion about the next generation. And if we were to think about an incubator, these cultural trends are sort of the incubator for our younger generations. So it's into this cultural context that our younger generations are born, and therefore it's in these younger generations that these values are most acutely seen and felt. And so the question that we want you to discuss, two questions actually. The first question is, how are these cultural trends, oh, before this, sorry, we'll just leave it. So th that's not these questions, don't, don't discuss these questions yet. Those are the next set of questions that you'll discuss. So the first question is, how are some of these Canadian cultural trends, how are these insights seen in our younger generation? Right? If they're sort of the incubator where these things are sort of uh, birthed, uh, how are they seen? So those sort of three values, how are they seen in our, the behaviors, actions, and attitudes of our youngest generations? And then the second question is, is what are the implications for us as churches? Right? And again, as we think about implications for engagement, the strengths that our younger generations offer to the church, their concern for openness, creative expression, fairness, tolerance, are also values that threaten the church. And younger generations do not fight to stay connected with the church, but just move on to find acceptance in other groups, causes, and organizations. So intentional effort will be required to help younger generations know that the church is still relevant to them. And the disconnection between the local church and younger generations I believe is significant and gives evidence for the need for us as leaders in the church to establish pathways that bridge the relational gap that exists. So, so the first question is, thinking of our Canadian culture, 
post-modern, post-Christian, post-social, how are those three things seen and felt and evidenced in the younger generations? And then the second question is, these things are real. How can we sort of pivot as a church? How can we pivot so that we are in a position of strength to engage with them? How can we build pathways to bridge the relational gap that exists? Fair enough? I know there's, there's, there's whole uh, seminars and you could take seminary courses on this, so we're just going to spend a few moments talking about this. So go to your tables, take some time, and rock this one out. And as you're doing that, you can also be thinking of these couple questions. What pivots might we need to take? That's some of the implications. And then how might we lead this towards kingdom engagement? All right, have some fun. If we could get everyone's attention again. I know you could talk about this one all day long. Especially those of you who are working with teenagers. Uh, this is one of those spaces where even millennials are trying to figure out the Generation Z, because they operate different, you especially. All right, so we're going to move to a time where we just, uh, we're looking for a little bit of feedback. Uh, what did you discuss at your tables, um, specifically um, current trends, cultural trends? Uh, how are they seen and in, in, uh, how are you seeing them in uh, the younger generations? And then we'll move over to the implications for meaningful engagement, secondly. Um, what do you think? How are you seeing uh, some of these things? So we, we just talked a little bit about, um, you know, this post-Christian society where, you know, we just assume that people know who Jesus is, but they don't. Um, I think that's been true for a while, but it's just, for those of us who are in the church, it's just weird to us, right? Um, we don't necessarily realize it. Um, it's harder for people to sh feel open to share different ideas. You know, in a world where if you disagree with someone, you might be called out as a bigot or a, a hateful person. It's hard to disagree. Um, people, kids feel isolated. Uh, not just kids. We at our table were like, we all have felt lonely in church at, at different times. Um, there's desire for deep relationships, um, not necessarily programs, but like relational, uh, especially kids with social media and technology, they, they want to connect, but they don't know how. Yep. Um, and, and that they're not looking for easy answers. They want to live in tension. They want to have complicated conversations and, and delve into the, the big issues. Uh, they don't just want to be told what's right and what's wrong. Right. Good. Thanks, Aaron. What else you got? Whoa. Everybody pay attention. <laughs> this is going to be on the exam. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, well, we talked about a number of things at our table. Um, where to start? Sorry. I think the big thing for us is seen in your younger generation. There's a temptation to see these all things as negative. Um, and the temptation is to kind of like point and say, youth and young people are like this. And one thing that I think is a good measure, if we can't place women or ethnicity in that sentence instead of youth and still feel comfortable about any ethnicity and still feel comfortable about saying it, we should probably shut our mouth, um, for one. So if you were coming after me, just fair warning. Um, <laughs> The other thing is like post, post social, post modern, post Christian are all beautiful things. Um, to, to, to be the, to have a post social place where we can actually not have our relationships dependent on authorities and powers, but actually can be rooted in Jesus, thank, thank the Lord. Mm -hmm. to, be, to be past modernism, which rooted everything in reason, uh, and to be able to move with the Spirit and feel Jesus in our life, beautiful. To be post-Christian, where we aren't about power and control, but we are allowed to lay down our power and follow out the way of Jesus in the everyday, caring for the marginalized? Yes. Thank God these are our reality moving forward, because we need, we, we need it. Yep. The church has been plagued by these things. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> Anything else? Everyone's scared to go up after Mark after he let it off, though. You got it? 
Thanks, Mark. <laughs> um, I just forgot everything I was going to say, so it's a good thing I got notes. Um, we talked about whether or not we can even access um, this stuff or understand what our kids um, really think about all of these things. And um, I think, I, at least I came to the conclusion that, that it, I really don't have full access to it. And I wonder if I ever figured it out, it's, as soon as I did, I'd be wrong about most people or about most of the youth. Um, so uh, what we determined is that our kids don't have the hang-ups that we have um, as adults. They have their own, which are different. Um, we, we started to zero in on love, um, that uh, sort of a long-rooted relationship of love is what speaks louder than anything. Um, and if we can position ourselves in that way, um, maybe that would go a lot longer or a lot further. Um, can you? Yeah, was there anything else? I, there's some other things here, but. Okay. All right, anybody else? You were all talking a lot so maybe some of you need to get into that Coca-Cola back there or something. Coffee? <laughs> yeah, Mark, great word from such a terrible guy. Um, <laughs> I know. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, just mentorship and building authentic relationship. Um, I mentioned that I read something recently where, you know, we know Gen Z is probably the first uh, generation that doesn't need adults for information. Uh, and so that doesn't mean they don't need us for wisdom and discernment. It just means they don't need us for information. So, you know, we, uh, we finish high school and we go to Bible college, we go to seminary, and we learn all of these great things that we're like super excited to tell everybody about. And all we want to do is like, let me tell you all the smart things that I know. Um, and although that might have worked before, maybe, um, but certainly now it's, it's much more of a listen first, um, relationship first, belong before believe, I think. I don't know if Martin said that or somebody said that. Um, attitude. Um, what was that? I didn't say it, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, so that's all. Very good. Thanks, Mike. Anyone else? You ready to move on to implications, even though it's kind of started? Implications of meaningful engagement with this generation, next generations. Um, I think we have to be real with this generation. I don't think we can be fake, um, and I don't think we can pretend we have it all together when we don't, um, which, by the way, doesn't work well for us either. Um, and so because they, like, we just need to be real and transparent and admit when we fail and be honest about that um, because that's how healthy relationships happen. Agreed. Thank you. Lots been, has been said about love. You guys mentioned it. Even belong before believe is all about a, a posture of acceptance and welcome and all the rest of that. But when we think about that whole concept of love, we need to love on the terms of the person we're seeking to allow to experience love. So sometimes we, we talk about love and we're like, well, we are being loving. So like, well, do they experience love? Do they know that you're loving them in that? Because if not, you're actually not loving. Yeah. That's great. Uh, last pitch and praise, there was a poet, we're not talking about pitch and praise, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> there was a poet, Joe McCarrow, and he led a session the one morning, and it's really stuck with me ever since. He gave this image of uh, being a shepherd and how do you take care of sheep, and the idea was if you have a fenced-in paddock, uh, the sheep are going to want to get out. Um, 
But if you have a well in the middle of an open field, they're going to stay close to that well. And yeah, just the idea that like we need to be that well, that place of value, of love, of support, that will always be there for them, um, no matter what happens. That's probably going to be so much more useful than, than a, a fenced-in box that they're going to want to escape. And once they're out, they're out. So. Thanks, Alex. That was good. Oh, here comes the clarification. Interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. This is the interpretation of what you just said. No. Um, so actually, we um, engaged with our youth before this event because we actually wanted to hear it straight from their mouths. And yeah, we prepared. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. So we. We asked them to basically build a church. What does that look like? Um, what, like, anything, like, who's teaching? Like, where is it? And I just told them, like, it has to honor God. It has to keep in mind um, what did Jesus do and uh, the early church and um, the greatest commandment. So 90% of them said, I want a house church. So, like, small family stuff. So... Yeah, it spoke volumes. That's powerful. Thank you. James? <laughs> it feels good when you clap before you even say anything. Um, <laughs> we didn't really get to this, but there were two things kind of on my, my mind. Um, uh, this generation really needs um, truth. They're so lost. They don't know what truth is, and yet they don't want to be told what truth is. So there's a balance there. Um, and the other thing, um, Mark, you mentioned uh, feel Jesus in their lives is a good thing. They really sense that and they, they think that. And I think you, you mentioned that. But just there's an openness to the Holy Spirit and a, the feeling aspect sure. of their relationship. And I think that's something that can be tapped into and that is going to be really important. Very good. Thanks, James. One of uh, the, I want to add on the church house church part. Uh, one of the things I uh, enjoy the least at my church is to change the church sign. Uh, so just before the snow came in, we we, we are stuck with this sign which says, uh, uh, "Don't just go, don't just do church, become the church." Uh, first of all, I was happy I don't have to change the sign until maybe sometime soon, hopefully. Uh, I think uh, when I think about going through all these challenges with uh, challenges and opportunities, and I think one of the things Mark said here, and I think he said it uh, on the mic, is that uh, we, we are not having to look at all these as uh, negative, but it's also opportunities. Uh, the t technology is not all bad. It has brought a lot of great things. Where was I heading with this? Um, how do we deal with this, uh, or how do we enjoy this? We need to stop concentrating on uh, teaching kids to go to church, but to become the church, and we should moderate ourselves. Yeah, thanks, Ease. 